Hello. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote today. Um, I'm Dominic from Drop Solid, and we proud sponsor, diamond sponsor, four time. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, we bring to you this year the most open digital experience platform. And Dries was already talking in his keynote this morning about how important it is to keep control of the content, the code, and also the data. Yeah. And since Drupal is also expanding, it's, it's more than a digital experience. It's, it's a digital experience platform. It also branches out to other applications like Matic, you know me, marketing automation, and there's also open variants of this too. And if you believe just like us that it's important that you keep this content, this code, this data secure under your control, then I think it's worth looking at this. We're at boot 31, so my colleagues will uh, definitely will uh, be happy to give you a demo. And then this brings me to our speaker. Our speaker, Tavi Kotka, is one of the first CIOs in the world of a country. So in fact, Estonia was the first country in the world who had a CIO. He's an engineer at heart, and he also runs uh, several startups as an angel investors, angel investor. And um, yeah, he has a thing or two to, to tell us about how digital societies these days are evolving. So I give it up for Tavi. Hello. I promise to you, I went to the bar yesterday in Prague to have a beer. And obviously, all the bars were full, were full of Drupal engineers. So I asked if I can make a picture with some of you. And I got this acceptance. And I promised that I will put you on stage. Please. <laughs> I think you're here, at least one of you. <laughs> Obviously, no ladies. <laughs> but um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I, I truly would like to share uh, some of the background, uh, what happens in different regions, in different countries with, uh, with their like, goal to build a proper digital society what it gives back, and uh, why everybody should do it, and why can't they do that. Uh, I mean, lots of you are actually developing for the governments. Estonia, all uh, major government uh, portals, or like websites, are actually run on Drupal, so we are the proud users. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, very quickly, I said, I'm an engineer, uh, I have uh, Master degree in software engineering uh, and information technology. I've built up several companies, uh, software engineering companies, and then was hired uh, by the government. Uh, why? Because when you have a significant share and then you sell your shares in the company, you get this non competition thing. You can't compete. And the Estonia is so small, it's only 1.3 million people, so we are all relatives. So we all meet each other in funerals and weddings. So the government noticed that, oh, that guy is unemployed. So they offered me a job. Obviously, I said no. Because if you're 33 and perfectly healthy, you don't work for the government. But uh, they were very persuasive. And, uh, 
And in the end of the day, I said, okay, I, had, I have two conditions. Like, uh, one thing, uh, you support any kind of reform we do, doesn't matter how crazy it is. Polit full political support. Second, I need the parking space behind the government building. Because it was in an old town, like in Prague, like it's, there's nowhere to park, like, so you, like, I need the space. And uh, to be honest, it was harder to get the parking spot. <laughs> it's funny, I mean, um, very quick background. Uh, Estonia and Finland are like almost same age. So Finland was, uh, be became republic uh, two months before Estonia. That's where the big brother and young brother thing comes from. Like, so, uh, so we always have to look up to Finland because they are north, like you always. If you're in front of the map, you look north, like you look up, like so we look up to Finland. Uh, but our development was stopped by Soviet Union in 1940, and uh, we got back our in, like, independence in 1991, so basically now 30 years ago, 31 years ago. And um, if you compare all those previous Soviet Union republics, uh, I can proudly say that Estonia is most developed. Uh, our average salary is 30%, free zero, 30% higher than the second best of all of those. Uh, like we are the best in Europe at the moment in education, uh, one of the best in healthcare. And uh, we always ask ourselves the question like, what's the reason? Why? I mean, everybody had the same starting point. And we are not in the middle of the center of Europe, we are in the Nowhere. It's the same latitude as Alaska. Like, so it's like, you saw the weather, I mean, like, the, almost the same like in Finland. But, uh, and our answer is, it's a uh, digital society. The way how country was built up uh, in both sectors, in private sector and government sector, how they jointly have used technology and pushed this government, the country, to the uh, new future, more healthy future. So that has been our motto. Right? You need a great pain to make change happen. And the Estonian pain was that uh, when you broke apart from Soviet Union, you basically have nothing, you have zero. Like, so you don't have any economy. I mean, whoever, whoever of you is communist or socialist and wants to try it out in your country, it doesn't work. I can promise you, I have lived that. So. None of our, my generation guys can say that, uh, like my entrepreneurial father said, there is, doesn't exist this kind of sentence because there wasn't any entrepreneurship in Soviet Union. So we had to like, figure it out and develop like, all by ourselves. And also, Estonia is tiny people-wise, but we are huge land-wise. So we are land-wise, we are bigger than, bigger than Belgium or uh, Switzerland. Uh, so uh, if you basically, um, like, you have like very many small towns and villages full of people, but not enough people to afford, let's say, a proper bank establishing their office there. So there's not enough people to serve other people. So there was a push, like, please use technology, please use um, um, self-service, like, uh, and it was way before smartphones. So it started in 1990s. Um, the first wave was, I think, 2000, and now the second wave is after 2010. So that was our pain. And it's interesting, if you have political support, you actually can build digital society as an engine. And, I mean, you are engineers. You understand that, like, it doesn't matter if I'm building a healthcare system or government system or um, like a bank system or some kind of warehouse. They are all the same. I mean, yeah, some of, like, let's say we have a, a table of, of persons or table of patients or table of citizens. But when we look at the attributes, like it's still surname, forename, birth date, address, what services we are providing, are they paying, are they paid full or not. So in the end of the day, they're all the same. So, and it's like, I always argue when people think 
Today, I think I actually consider China to be the most advanced digital society, not even Estonia or Finland. It is China. Or si uh, the Chinese system or the Swedish system, they don't, like, they're almost the same. I mean, it's not like, oh, China is big, China is huge, and let's say Estonia is 1,000 times smaller. So let's say in the banking system in China includes all the uh, functionalities. You can buy, uh, you can borrow money, you can do the payments, etc. But Estonia as a 1,000 smaller country, like we can only look at our balance sheet. So the size doesn't matter. Like the small country needs the same functionalities as the, as the large country. And uh, so the same goes with healthcare system, education, etc. It's not the way that in China, you have all the functionalities, and in Estonia, in healthcare, it's the uh, patient registration, and the next step is symmetry, because you're small. So, all the countries need to build the systems in the same way. And private sector has understood that. Like, so, all the reforms, what we have seen from mainframes to nowadays, from uh, like huge licenses uh, to open source, etc., it all has happened in private sector but not in government. And it's actually a simple playbook, like how to create this society. And I will stop in some of them where I see where the whole world, not world world, but like, uh, like most of the countries are actually stuck. So very simple, basic thing. For example, the child is born in the hospital. And uh, if child is born, the money like the mother should get the child support money. Let's have this use case. So in like normal world, like uh, you get your child, you get back home, then you go to the local, uh, local municipality, like you let them know that you have a child, and then like, like somehow like the support money, like in the end of the day, if you go to the social ministry to have another application, you get the money. So instead of having a society that works this way, that uh, child was born in the hospital. So the hospital registers in the system, new child to this mother. Not father, that comes later. Just mother, because that's uh, technically <coughs> okay, proven. So this child was born. So uh, then the request automatically from the hospital system goes to the government population registry, stating there is a newborn, please issue me unique identifier. Population registry issues a new identifier. So, and on the same time, when the hospital now has full profile, uh, the population registry also calls to the Ministry of Social Affairs that this lady had a child. This is system to system, out, fully automated. So social ministry should now pay or that say that, okay, you have to have this kind of amount of uh, child support money. But this is dependent how much money the mother earned before. It's a salary issue. So how can we get that information? Tax and custom. What is your information about this lady? Okay, coming back, doing the calculations. Now sending, but the payments are done by Minister of Finance. So you have to work with Minister of Finance to get the payments out. And now, like, um, this kind of simple use case that seems so smooth, I think exists in not more than five countries in the world. And you ask me, like, why? I mean, like, it should be super simple to build that. I mean, like, what's the question? Easy as hell, right? One of the reasons is here. So why countries can't reach a proper digital society for the future? This is my unique identifier. If there are any Indians here, this is my Aadhaar number. So, uh, and in many countries you have a social security ID. But in most countries you only can use it for taxes or in healthcare. But this is secret for private sector. So how can the hell I can connect my private sector data or databases with my government databases if you don't, if you don't use the same unique identifier about the person. So John Smith in one table and John Smith in another table is not the same John Smith. Okay, let's add, add an address. 
you, you all know it doesn't work this way. And like, you're, you're laughing, but this is, has been a political decision for basically all Anglo-Saxon countries. You can't connect data in this way in Germany, you can't connect data in this way in the UK, you can't connect data in the US, in Canada, Australia. Uh, in India it was slightly prohibited, but now they, I think they're getting it back to the right track. But you can in China, and in Nordics, and East Europe. So there are countries who have this basic standard issue. Think about that you're building a customer system and, 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 and like customer ID is not allowed. How the hell I build a customer like, I mean, oh, 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 impossible. But in most countries in the world, that's the, that's the main problem. And if you don't solve that, and it's a political issue, if you don't solve that, you can't basically start exchanging data between private sector and government sector because you don't see it in the same way. Boom. So all those countries who are, don't have that system, they already have a huge obstacle they can't move for further. So, uh, another thing, like, even if you solve that, the next question is that, okay, I can connect the databases, but, like, what else, like, countries can do to basically move fast forward to the future? And one of the issues that is still very purely solving the world is identity. So how can I be sure that behind the device is exactly that person? How much should trust Google identity? Should I be able to transfer, I don't know, 100 million with Google identity? No. Or yes. Or like from the money laundering perspective? No. That, okay, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the perspective can be different. So, what on, the, on this screen, what you see here is that um, we figured out that uh, instead of every bank building their own identity, instead of every telecom building their own identity, instead of every portal site building their own identity, what if, what if we, we create the legal framework that if your identity system is according to that legal framework, like, you can basically, like, uh, the government that proves that, uh, yes, behind that device is particularly that person. I mean, easy to, easy to say. So basically, we force people to go and show themselves to police and get this national ID card. You have to go and you have to get it. So it was mandatory. Th that's actually very, um, we copied this uh, from Finns our older brother. This is 100% the same card what Finland has, with the one different, very small difference. We actually made it work. Right? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So, and we added, and, like, and, and, the, and how we made it work was, uh, a carrot and stick, always. Okay, in Estonia, as you, if you come from Soviet Union, uh, the stick is more, uh, works better. Uh, so, uh, the black line represents uh, the, adoption, the adoption, but like uh, the people going and taking the ID card. So, everybody had to have, by law, an ID card. You see it, 2008, 2009, like almost the whole society had a national ID card. Uh, you see this usage? Usage is the blue line. And that difference is called CIO nightmare. Because, like, what do you think? Do, you, do they actually love you during this, uh, this, uh, this period? I mean, nine years. Why we need this plastic? Do you know how much money we spend on this, like? It's not even a good plastic to scratch an ice from the car window. <laughs> what, what the hell we do with this? And it's a chicken and egg problem, like that you would see in, in your life every day. Like, so you just like sit there and say, wait, it will come. A year later, wait, it will come. Wait. 
and like then you say change the CIOs. <laughs> so uh, in the end of the day, somebody will be the champion. And that has been a problem for many countries. For example, Australia has tried twice to implement national ID, failed uh, because the next, I mean, the cycle is longer than four years. So if there is a new prime minister here, it will instantly kill the project and say that the previous one was manky, right? So, uh, but <laughs> yeah, but that's the perfect thing. If you are in Estonia, small, just like started from the Soviet Union, etc., you don't have money. The project is too big to fail. So the ID cards cost us so much that we couldn't cancel it because we knew that we don't have money for the next one. Yeah. So uh, I think you want to listen to that in in in, in Trooper conference. Uh, Estonia, we are like heavy and proud supporters of any open source and uh, like uh, any free stuff. There is no McKinsey and, or Accenture in Estonia. Not because they don't know how to do stuff. They don't, but like uh, we don't have money. <laughs> and they, they, they only follow the money. So the next thing uh, you do, I need to do, like when you have these unique identifiers, what is very important uh, is to solve the data exchange issue. And again, like China is number one here, in, in like, uh, obviously. It means that you should put, push all the systems to work and talk with each other. So uh, this is a snapshot of the Estonian government uh, uh, databases. Let's call it this way. Actually, not databases, applications plus databases. So uh, bigger green dots are more used, small green dots are less used. All the black lines are actual APIs between the, between the, the registries. Uh, obviously, it's not just uh, simple APIs. There is a proper infrastructure between that. Uh, we call it X-Road. But uh, the beauty of this is that if you do it correctly, I mean, um, let's say in UK, you have a ministry. And if your ministry doesn't communicate with other uh, parties, uh, you need to gather all information uh, you need for your services from the citizens, and you need to store them. So the passport information, for example, may lie in this ministry, in that ministry, in the third ministry, and fourth ministry. So how many times you need to protect the passport information? At least four times. If one of those four is doing a lousy job, like, what's the value of the rest doing the great job? So it's a broken system by heart. In Estonia, like, we use the method where there's a rule. Uh, the data can be asked from the citizen only once. So the same data cannot be in two different locations. So if the passport data needs, needs to be asked, you send a request using the unique identifier from the population registry, and you pull the information, and it's there. And that's how it should work. And it truly works, like, uh, already 20 years. Like, uh, and... Uh, Funny, like, it looks like a privacy concern, but, uh, and it gets to the privacy, uh, but it's also a huge um, helper uh, in cyber attacks. So we had the first cyber war in human history. Uh, it was uh, after 2007, it was in 2007 between Russia and Estonia, uh, where they tried to hack us and attack us uh, heavily. The maximum damage was one bank system was down for one hour and 30 minutes. And uh, they couldn't take it down because of this picture. So instead of hacking one system and getting it all, even if you hack one system and you get inside, to get the full picture of the data set, you need to hack another one. But they are built all in different ways, in like uh, using different technologies. So it's theoretically possible to hack it and take it down, but it's very expensive. And this model like, seems to be working, at least like, uh, we have survived all the other attacks like, uh, during the last 15 years from the first one. Privacy. If everything is connected, then you have a problem, right? So how can you take away the problem of the privacy? I mean, whenever you go to German, like, you say that, OK, let's build this all-connected system, they will say, what about privacy? Please raise your hand if you think that privacy is a concern in Estonia. Or like if you see this as a concern. Yeah, 
Okay. I, I should fast forward like two smart people. Um, it is, uh, the privacy is a concern, but it's interesting, um, okay, social outcome. If you give people a chance to see who has looked their data, this is enough. Just knowing that the possibility exists is enough to take down all the privacy issues. So you think that like your systems in your country are private. Can you raise your hand uh, if you know who has accessed your medical records during like during last 12 months? Like, you truly know that who accessed. Like big, big, big hand like up there. All Estonians? <laughs> yeah, some okay. I say quickly like ten I read from, from the audience like. So if you don't know that, if it's on paper or in a hospital system, who protects your privacy? If any nurse can go and open you and like read you, like who protects your privacy? Compared with the system that like uh, we use that you go in, you see that okay, this hospital, this doctor, this hospital, this nurse, this hospital, that, that third person, or this policeman, etc. Why this policeman? Pardon, my mistake. <laughs> like, so, uh, if you have built this kind of issues, like solutions, like people calm down. They don't see privacy as a concern anymore. Actually, they feel the privacy is more protected because they can control it. They can ask questions. And if hospital cannot answer, the doctor gets fired instantly. If the information is uh, forwarded to the third person, let's say journalist, jail, start packing. It's up to the judge if you go for one year or two years, but you are going. You do a couple of public hangings, and like, truly starts to work. Hangings, I mean, um, uh, like, not actually hanging, but <laughs> like putting in jail. So, uh, and this works. So you can pass this Orwell problem. And, um, okay, another thing, a funny thing. Uh, who believes that uh, voting over the internet, not the machines in the corner type of thing like in the US, but voting at home from your computer is actually possible? If you believe in that, please raise your hand. Like it. Why don't you do it? Trust. I mean, like, but you trusted it. You said it's okay. Why can't you do it? So we started from 2005, uh, because everybody has a digital identity, like proven by the government, guaranteed by the government. If you use that identity or any uh, like product on, like built on top of that, uh, uh, like basically core identity that uh, goes through the audits, like vote. I mean, the machine says it's you behind the computer, only you know the pins, like only you have the face. Easy. I mean, like, yeah, obviously, uh, I know that there's another country who just issued the possibility to do internet voting, but I mean, voting doesn't matter that in that country anyway, so, so it definitely doesn't work in, in certain types of countries. But, but you can actually like, see people like it. I mean, uh, it's old data. Uh, the fresh one is 50-50 now. So half of the people are going physically to the voting stations and half goes and vote over the internet, which is the best proof that if you have proper tools and the whole, the private sector together with government sector has built this proper trust in society, you actually can advance very rapidly. And now I tell you where you can advance or like what's, what's are the like, fancy stuff we have done or we believe that will happen. Uh, yeah, so we'll go for a couple of them. Uh, governments understand one thing per se, and it's taxes. So how do you get the government budget full? I mean, that question is not arguable. Like, we can argue, like, uh, on privacy concerns, or, like, should we do e-voting or not? We can argue that kind of thing. But, like, the money needs to get into the government treasury. So any ideas in that field? How can we get more? How can we get like uh, uh, less fraud? Bring. 
So we had a huge problem with uh, VAT frauds. So, uh, I mean, companies do business. And there is no chance that any uh, tax authority except US, we are afraid of. <laughs> Even if you're not a US citizen, I'm still afraid of. <laughs> so, uh, like, there's no chance that you can control the whole economy. It's impossible. Like, uh, you go into the company and say, okay, give me your filings, and then you give them, and like, now we go through them, and then, oh, there's a link. Give me your filings, like, okay, let's go through them. Uh, we have later discovered that uh, most, I'll say, difficult cases we had with tax fraud actually had more than 30 these kind of links. So even if we physically would start tracing a particular deal, we would end up after five years with the, with the right kind. So it's an impossible task. Uh, or you work with society, and that's an interesting thing, like where society believes that digital tools actually help, they come and help. And I think like helping the society is one of the Drupal's core values. Like so, uh, so what I mean by this? Uh, so the head of tax and custom came to my office and said that we are losing two percent of government budget, two percent of government budget every year because of VAT fraud. What can we do? And I don't know, like what you have tried. Okay, we hired more and more auditors. So we sent more and more auditors to the to the companies, but like we are basically capable to control maximum four up to five percent of the deals. Like so it's impossible. Even in a small country like Estonia. Impossible task. So uh, yeah we get a couple of guys but the re the rest run free. Okay. And the idea was that but what if like we ask companies to give data to the government, all their business secrets, for free. So what if on, in, in every month you declare with whom you actually had business? Okay, let's say I sold you something, in something worth 2,000 euros. And we both report now, on a certain date, we report to the government that you say that you bought from me, I said I sold to you, and the robot on the government side later like next month, see, oh, there's a match, like you declare this way, the other guy that way, there's a match, like, should, like VAT should come from this guy, and we should give VAT back to that lady. So it works. How the hell are we going to say to the people that, please give me all the names with whom you are doing business, and in which amounts? Insane. That's the beauty. When the society actually starts to trust the private sector working to the government, it wasn't an issue at all. The fact, as a nation, we are losing like 2% of government budget every year because of the cheaters. I mean, if we get, get rid of cheaters, we get more equal market. It's better business, it's better business environment for everybody. And that was enough. So the, I mean, the whole law and implementation, less than a year. And the numbers started to improve before the dead, uh, deadline because like, everybody understood that like, <laughs> now when they actually start controlling those transactions. I mean, now it works this way, that if I declare I sold and you don't declare that you bought, they will come after you. Like, the guy said, like, you sold to you, but you haven't reported. Like, why? So the robot comes after one deal, and it, it can be fully automated. So you basically can fully control like, like if the deals happened or, no, or not. So the tax and custom used to have 4,500 people. I know it's small in your scale, but in Estonia it's huge. Like one of the largest enterprises. Now it's 1,200. So 70% 70 70 decrease in government. <laughs> you never hear that like <laughs> government. Obviously the overall government costs have went up and also the amount of people, but uh, taxes, are, taxes are, are lower. So, and it also gives you, like, having this kind of information, and uh, you can actually can start giving back that information to the market. So, you see your company that, okay, in your field of business, there are 2,500 companies. Uh, you are performing 
in a, in a upper uh, upper thirty percent, like an average salary in your in those companies is this, that, and third thing. The export amounts are this, that, and third thing. Basically, you can full understanding like how you personally perform against the market, particularly in your area. And like the funny thing is that like we have so much data that could be useful, and that's one of the problems of the future digital society is that you don't have enough smart people to ask right questions. I mean, what should we search? Like, how the fifth year curriculum, like the curriculum that the person had in the fifth grade, how this affects your future salary? I mean, this challenge could be accepted and because we have data and everything is connected, we could solve it. But not many enough smart people to understand that. So you, you actually go there step by step. But what is interesting is that society is willing to give data if they want. Uh, healthcare. Um, the fact that you can go to any doctor or pharmacy with no papers and like not starting, let's say, lady, have you had measles? Like, or what's your medical history? I mean, what's the system? Like, like it's all there. I mean, uh, it's long. There was also one funky disease I, my friend, not my, my friend got in Thailand. This is hidden now. You can hide data. Like, let's say, for example, abortion is usually hide uh, by the lady. Um, so any doctor cannot see that, but statistically it's still there. So you can hide data. That's the true, true GDPR. You actually can control it. And uh, it has been in Scandinavia, it has been in place before GDPR was introduced in, 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 in Europe. But having this connectivity gives you a chance that you, healthcare is not local anymore. So countries have monopolized certain areas. Education, uh, healthcare, business environment. Uh, but, I mean, look, let's look around, especially after COVID time. Education. Uh, I can get an MIT degree nowadays without leaving country, right? So we know that, like, not all the degrees, but certain type of degree I could get from MIT, even though it's in the US. Internet courses, works. I mean, we have seen that. Cool, super cool. Healthcare. Um, it's not a secret that, like, like Indian healthcare is, is getting better, 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 and, like, like, quite significant amount of operations, like, hard operations, uh, that usually we had done in US, now it's done in India. Normal. I mean, if I could get the service that is equally good or even better, uh, with a way lower price, like uh, people will follow the money. Right? So healthcare still is, most countries, a monopoly of the government. But if you think about it, I mean, we pay 20% of our salaries for healthcare. We have the equal healthcare system that everybody gets equal healthcare, but like you have to pay 20% from your salary. Huge. Compared with, for example, personal uh, healthcare insurance. I mean, Obamacare was peanuts with, like, compared with the money uh, that Nordic people are paying for the healthcare. So, uh, what if people start to say that, okay, I will buy the basic healthcare from my own country? But the more difficult ones, I let insurance cover it, and I do it outside of the country, because I can travel. Just to remind, let's keep that in mind. So another was like the education. So if, so if schools are better in other countries than, than in my country, or they provide like different type of outcome that I, I truly liked, I can have it now. I mean. We can move with the family, or like we can take the courses, or like I, I can move to the countries where the education is better. But what happens then with the universities in your country? And okay, we are currently, we only talk about universities because it's tangible, we understand it. But think about it like if, if, if let's say, you understand that if you put your child in that particular, I don't know, uh, U.S. school uh, in some states, like uh, the outcomes are like the, 
the, the outcome is, is way better because like the, the, the way how they interact and the, the children, like how they interact, like um, are the, are the ones from the parents that you like. So there's no like border type of thing anymore. And this gets me to one of my, I think, most known challenges. I worked, the CIO works in Minister of Economy. So, uh, and the Minister of Economy is basically only minister in every country who is concerned about earning money, not just spending. So, uh, and if you come from private sector and you're an entrepreneur, like, uh, so you're in the Minister of Economy, and your main goal is to increase the wealth of your nation. Okay, how can I do that? I mean, let's think in business terms. Uh, if, I grew, uh, if I want to get the better and bigger company, I need more revenue, I need more profit. Okay, for the better profit, uh, what can I do? Profit means revenue minus cost. Okay, I can cut cost. But cost can be cut only to a certain extent. Like, uh, there's a point where like, you can't cut cost anymore. But with the revenue, I mean, pfft, sky is the limit. Just figure it out how to get the revenue to you. Okay, how can we get it? So, uh, who creates revenue for countries? People. We say people, not citizens, because like, there are also like, non-citizens, people who contribute to your economy. So, basically, we need more people. Easy. So I went to my wife, and they said, like, I have this 10 million challenge now. Let me remind you, Estonia is 1.3. And why 10 million? Because Sweden is 9.6. And we want it to be better. <laughs> That's why 10. Like, OK. So I went to my wife saying, ta -da, I have an idea. We need to grow our economy, so uh, let's go to 10 million. We have four children. Yeah, so, uh, and my smart wife said that, like, I mean, I love your husband, but um, you know that first 20 years or 25 years, this, is, this investment is just a liability. No payback, more cost. So you don't, I mean, it's the same, like, CIO gap thing, like, you remember, like, numbers up, but, like, the outcome comes many years later. I mean, I envy Egypt. Like, Egypt pops out one stone every year. They increase their population 1.5 million every year. Like, could, that would be fun. Not in Estonia. So, yeah. Back then, I had three of them, now I have four. Cutie. Uh, so, it doesn't work. But, like, who says? I mean, I mean, can we get more like people from elsewhere? Like US is extremely like so good in, in, in attracting talent and then getting the talent to to the country. There's a problem. We didn't let it to Alaska. So the weather is so shit that nobody wants to live there. Except uh, except me. <laughs> I mean we are used like uh, we used to be this, but um and okay, we have huge hopes on climate change. So yes, there are very bad things with climate change, but for a couple of countries, it's still good. <laughs> yeah. We don't brag about this kind of stuff, but like this summer. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the UK was burning and the rest, but like, come to Estonia. <laughs> Anyways, but like, if they don't come to come, but I mean, like, like, we have fully digital society, which means that we are actually capable to serve our diaspora all over the world. If Estonia lives in Singapore, he or she can run, like, he has the digital identity, he, all the services are online, like, you can run your company from Singapore. If there are elections, like, just open your computer, elect. Like, you don't have to travel anywhere, like, so you can sign all the comp contracts in digitally, etc. Like, we all do that, it's all accepted. All the courts are act accepting those documents, etc. So, like, we can serve Estonians all around the world. Why only Estonians? So, ta -da! what if 
we create digital citizenship without traveling, right? Because we are part of Schengen, so we just can't open up the door. That you fill the application, you become an e-resident. Voila, Schengen! <laughs> I mean, we would be okay because they don't stay in our country because it's so bad because of the weather. So they go to Germany, but like we still get the customer. Doesn't work. But teaching citizenship without voting right and without traveling. Access to European market. Great idea. Absolutely fantastic idea. Like Brazilians, like uh, Turkish, Indians, they all will start accessing European market through us. They do an application, the police reviews, proper, proper procedure, like if you are in a terrorist name list, you can't, but like if you are good, please, you open instantly a company from distance, you run it inside EU, like fantastic, fantastic plan. 70% of our e residents are from EU. What? Germans. Let me remind you, you are in EU. By the way, you are the EU. <laughs> so why the hell do you need the student in residency? I mean, like, like access to the market, like everything is there. Product market fit. Running a so solo entrepreneurial company in, in Germany costs you like eight up to 10,000 euro a year. Instead of fully digital company, costs you a fraction, like less than 1,000 a year. If you, if you want it fully automated, so you actually buy the services from the companies. If you do it by yourself, zero, no cost. And you still pay your taxes in your country, in Germany. So you don't pay taxes to us. So, and you can use your German bank account. You don't have to use our bank account. And it seems to be the bureaucracy is so hurdle, a huge hurdle for the people that just to get rid of that, they're willing to move their company to another location. This is not nothing new or something new. Where is the Apple company incorporated? Where is Coca-Cola Incorporated? Delaware. They're all Delaware companies. So that was already invented in 1896, I think, 94. So this kind of thinking is more than 130 years old. So nothing new. And it works. There's a problem. I promised them 10 million. There is at the moment 94,000 e-residents. So, but I promised it by 2025, so I have still three years. And there can be exponential growth, like a hockey stick, obviously. No, you can't. I mean, that's what happens when you get, let lawyers do, do, uh, to ruin your product. Instead of saying, you can apply for a student and digital citizenship. It's not a citizenship. Like, it, you can't use legally that word. You should use a word called residency. How many people in the world understand what is a residency? Maybe they understand tax residency, but what is the e-residency? So just like, like, I mean, simple, small steps, and you kill the project. Like, I don't play them. Because even though I don't have 10, I still have good enough. Our population is 1.3 million. 635,000 approximately are the working age people. So we have increased the working age people amount significantly, like uh, in like tens of percentages, which is still like, yeah, growth gets better, but it's good. Uh, okay, let me come back to this. So, but what this experience, experiment showed and why it's important for the future development of digital societies, uh, there are more and more now uh, books written, for example, countries without borders and like, can, let's say, can I be a German citizen, but I, can I run my company through another co country? Yes, proven. Okay, Estonia is so small 
that um, politically it's quite easy to kill us on EU level. So if we come out with a reform that everybody believes, for example, we have pushed uh, digital signature, I think more than 15 years in, in EU Commission, like still not happening in EU in a proper way. Uh, like it's very easy to kill us. Let's say if this comes truly big, the other countries will find a method to just smash it. But what now, what if somebody who is already big does it? I don't know, like India. Can you screw with them? They don't care. I mean, they can handle it. And it doesn't mean that like you have to serve like Europeans. Like there are many countries around India that would love to like have access to the market and work in the market. India is it's advancing in digital field so rapidly that it's enormous. Like um, fantastic. Totally envy. There's reforms. And now think about it. Like if healthcare is location independent, education is location independent, to education location independent. Uh, business is location independent. Who needs location? So you can start creating totally different type of, type of communities, and also those kind of communities, like where let's say Silicon Valley dreams about that. What if we, I mean, what if we create our own country? I mean, seems to be po impossible dream, but what do you need for a country? It used to be land. There is actually a member in the United Nations that doesn't have land. It's a homework like to figure out like which country it is, but but I mean what if all the Trupal people create their own co like community so strong, so big? I mean, we always like one of the examples we use is like Jews before the country of Israel was born. They were in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in New York. Uh, Jews were everywhere. They survived as a nation, even though they bought services from different countries. So the same here. Like if the society, some kind of ecosystem, becomes so strong that they would want to be independent in certain field, it doesn't have to be everything. I mean, like if I'm an Estonian in New York, and if there is a red light. I still stand and wait, like an idiot, because everyone else is passing. Like, so <laughs> but like in my country, it's illegal, so I stand. So I obey your rules, I obey your orders. Like I act as like your society demands, but on the same time, I can create my own society. And this brings to the very interesting challenge, or like thinking, what happens with businesses? I mean, Spotify is a great. Swedish startup, fantastic. We have very, like one of the singers in Estonia, I truly love, like a remarkable artist. I asked him like how much money he has got from Spotify during the last seven years. I mean, he has uploaded his music there like, and he said during the last seven years, even though he's super popular in Estonia, from Spotify he got 150 euros. Not 150,000, but 150 euros. So every day, 60,000 songs are uploaded to Spotify. 60,000. And Ed Sheeran only gets money. So how the hell this structure works? I mean, for the most, I mean, like, like for the 99.9% .9 of musicians in the world, Spotify is not an income. They can't get money from there. It's broken. But what's the alternative? Apple Music, same. There's no alternatives. Like, so we have to do it this way. We just have to live that streaming is not the business for artists. Okay? Booking.com, love it. I mean, so simple to book like your next apartment or, or, or hotel. Love it. They take 30% of every booking. If you add government tax on top of that, which is like income tax, like 20%, like how much money the owner keeps? So the question is like, 
Like those models where super smart people have done incredible job and he, he, he like, I mean, they take the Figma exit now. They built a great tool, they exited with 20 billion and they said in the, their statement that it was all because of community, because you helped us to develop this tool to the absolutely perfect and that's why Adobe bought it with 20 billion. Thank you. How much you get gave back to the community? Those are barrancas, zero. So what the hell are you talking about? I mean, capitalism is good. I love capitalism, like, and I, I already said, socialism is bad. Socialism doesn't work. The question is, like, is there something? Is there something on top of that? Can we mix capitalism with socialism somehow? I mean, what if Vigma people? would actually gave from that 20 billion, together with investors, like Figma founders and investors and employees, what if they actually would give 2 billion to the community that actually helped? I mean, if you have 120 million or you have 100 million, what's the difference? Right? What if all the artists who doesn't benefit from Spotify actually take away their music from there and they only keep a couple of singles sell. Like they, they the most like the best songs. Because like from every artist we love a couple of songs. And I will keep them. So you love my music, I will keep all my the favorite ones are there. But all everything else mwah, away. Because like why should I keep it there? Because I got 150 euros for during seven years. What if, what if everybody does that? What, how it affects Spotify? What, what if like Booking.com is not used anymore by the the hotel owners, and they actually form their own Booking.com? Also, doesn't work. Has been tried. Uh, it doesn't work because if you do only do community-based business. There are several examples already in taxi industry, etc., where uh, like somebody needs to take the responsibility. There has to be a founder or founding team, something that basically takes a risk. Because if you don't like it, you as a driver or you as a hotel, you can always move away. But like somebody needs to take a risk. Like, but you need a critical mass. So I believe that there are like like other ways how future my like policies work. So for example, figure it, think this way, what if community would be your co-founder? There are, let's say, you have like two founding partners in Google, but the third one is community. So we all start with 30, 30, 30. And we make investors in and we are all diluted, but community always is there. It's booked. I mean, you can't just give it out because like, who's your community? But it's booked. And if you do something good for the business, you get a piece of that. And that way you, the community earns out their fair share inside the, company, community, inside the company. A different model, different way. And I think that's like one of the most interesting uh, uh, trends uh, at the moment that is not affected in any government, like public government system or, or unique identifiers or like system talking each other that the fact that the equity is still only shared between founders, investors, and employees. Employees get options. And you can't basically hire in IT field without giving options anymore, right? You know? So this model, model works. But to get any kind of business up and running, it doesn't matter how small you be or you are, you need others. You need your community. You need your customers, your helpers, partners, even your mom might be useful in some cases. Like Bill Gates' case, for example. Was it? Mother was in the IBM board or something. Okay, different story. So I end here. And uh, think about it. Think about the things that uh, if digital, like, it needs both sides. It needs private sector and government. If they work together, if they build the baseline in a proper way 
And currently, I see this there has been a proper way in my country, in China, in Singapore. China with a small thing. Uh, like in Estonia, the people control the data. In China, like uh, the government controls the data. But that this is just one parameter, you know, in IT terms. Like, but the systems are the same. So, but if you do that, your competitive capability against next other countries is so much larger. The way how, how like like how can you improve your healthcare quality? Or how you could uh, help improve your education qu uh, quality? And how can you keep taxes down? We don't have company uh, income tax in Estonia. Zero. Until you keep the money in the company, you don't have to pay tax. Nothing. Why? Because by OECD report, we are the best tax collectors in the world. So if everybody pays what needs to be paid and fairly, like you don't have to add new taxes. We don't have to increase taxes if you're efficient. Yes, there will be time when we have to like, do something, but at least last 30, 30 one years, we haven't had company tax, VAT tax. Not the VAT have had, like uh, the income tax. Interesting. And you can start develop new communities, small ones or even countrywide. That was my speech about the future. Thank you. I understood there won't be any questions, so I don't know if, even if I sit or not. There will be questions. So, hi everybody, I'm Janne. Uh, I got Tavi here and I'm glad that he actually delivered. So, the, uh, I was thrilled about the, about the session and there is surprisingly many questions from the, from the app. Or oh, not maybe surprising because this tech conference, but is there any... Oh, so, uh, oh guys, uh, actually please don't go because uh, it seems to be that we will have another group folder in the end, uh, from the balcony to towards this side, like it was just told me by the organizers. Yes, so we will have a group photo. When the questions and answers are over, then kindly turn around 180 degrees, and then the photo will be taken. So are there any live questions? Please. Paddy has here, let's have a mic. So, first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting. I come from Iceland, and I think that we are one of these countries that are pretty far in, in these terms. But what we are having in Iceland is uh, issues with accessibility and being so e-ready. you know, ready. So now everything happens through your phone. You can just like have your driver license. You don't have any cards anymore. And how is this? Like, you know, if we think about the elderly people or the people who have disabilities, they can't really use these things that we are just trying, you know, how is this in Estonia and what's, mm -hmm. what, what are you trying to do there? Yeah, this is actually a question I always get when I do this kind of speech in Scandinavia. The, always the first one. What about the elderly? And uh, it's sad to say, but uh, Estonians have a very arrogant answer to this. What about them? We don't care. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, we truly care. But the fact is that the thing that, like, I mean, whoever has built IT systems, you always fail with your product or with your application if you want to solve everybody's problem, right? So you have to do compromises. And one of the compromises you need to do whenever you introduce something totally new is that let's remove the, let's call them extremes. So the fact, for example, that like mobile screen might be too small for elderly people doesn't mean that you shouldn't develop a service that fits for the mobile device. So our approach has always been, and, and it has been proven successfully, that whenever we start with a new project, since the beginning it's agreed we only do the 80%. So we don't solve it for everybody. We solve it for 80%, then that 80% will help them, their elderly, because like, uh, like you go to Ukraine and you help. 
Uh, and then they, like, they, they, they basically, I'll say, they accept it later. So for example, e-voting in 2005 was uh, some kind of hippie and youngster thing. Now, elderly people are using e-voting more than youngsters. Why? I mean, officially, they care about more like, like uh, the country and they vote. I mean, every country has a problem that youngsters don't go to the voting. Like, so that's why I think the reason is. But like, today we have studies that show that like, e-voting is not discriminal. Like, so that no elderly people don't do that. They do, even more. But you have to start with some groups and then move further. So that's your answer. Very good. Then there's a question from the audience that how to prevent the government becoming authorian and then abusing the system. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, we have seen so many countries being perfect and then also, again, falling back. So, uh, um, I mean, one country I truly love, Georgia, for example. Like, so, uh, um, I mean, I don't know. But again, it's a question like uh, what then you can actually, uh, I'll say, uh, digitalize and what you can't. Like, uh, for example, like if you have this kind of potential problem, like uh, forget the voting. But I don't know, Sweden or Finland or, 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 or Norway or Iceland, you could do it like, because their values are different. Like the way how the society is built is different. So yeah, everything doesn't fit for everybody, definitely. And I don't have to answer. I mean, if I would know the answer, I mean, would there be any war in Ukraine? I have a continuing question, and then we take the person there. So what do you think about the, if there would be a kill switch in the system? That if there would be a situation that the government, the democratic government is overthrown, then somebody could sort of reset the system? Uh, yeah, it's... it's, uh, it's um um, like, I mean, we all know that the biggest cyber threat is not hacks. The biggest cyber threat is people. So if you have insider, like, that's the one you, it's hard to fight against. So again, like, if you have, uh, like, I mean, what happen, happens, what's the problem, problem with the killing switch is, um, I wrote my PhD uh, about data embassies, embassy of data. So. Uh, because after Crimea events, uh, um, we have to understand like how can we survive as a nation even if the country is occupied. So what if the, I mean, Estonia has been occupied every century since the beginning. We had the original original settlers, but every century there has been like Swedes, Germans, Germans, Russians, no Finns, but like uh, Poles and not like yet. others. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for, it's not, for us it's not a question if, it's always a question when. And uh, if, if your country is fully digital, you don't have paper fallback anymore. So how you protect those assets? So for example, one of the first reforms we did uh, in 1992 was uh, a property reform. So government restored the property situation what was before occupation. So if any of your grandfather or grandmother, for example, had a farm, before occupation, but the new power took it, took it away, then it was given back. You just had to prove that it was yours before that. Right? But you have like old books and archive materials for this. Now, if everything is digital, it's even better. Like data embassies are like actually, imagine uh, like physical embassies in the world. You know that there is a US embassy in, in, in Prague and, and Swedish embassy here, etc. And now figure, they think that in, let's say, one of the Czech uh, data centers, there's an iron cage. And inside the iron cage, the computers is actually Estonian embassy. So nobody can enter that. And you have to protect it in the same way like you protect the US embassy, for example, here. And this way you can basically, you don't need a kill switch. Uh, you, 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 you know that this is temporary, and in future you can restore it, even if it takes 100 years. Like, uh, so that's, you have to have a fallback outside of the hands of the bad man. But if you want to read it, like uh, data embassies, yeah, articles about, scientific articles about this uh, are published, so please read. 
Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was truly eye-opener for me. Uh, my only question, was it a screenshot from the public social uh, medical insurance interface that, that you showed earlier with the family doctor name on the top left corner? Yeah, uh, this one. My single question, uh, is this interface available in Estonian language as well? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, probably you just switch the language for the screenshot to make us understand yeah. the interface. Uh, okay. That's a nice gesture. I was just really curious that if it's translated to Estonian, probably. No, it's like, uh, no, no, it's uh, if you log into there, uh, you can choose either Estonian, Russian, or English as a language. So it's not Google Translate, it's uh, official support. And sadly, it's not Drupal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's shit. <laughs> I mean, data is good, but looks like shit, like, so, uh, yeah. But what is important here is the managing access to your health data. That's a super important thing. Most of us don't care. They just want to get treated. And like, if you want second opinion, you call another doctor in another hospital, and they open it up because you have allowed, and they give you a second opinion. Super cool. And if, I, if my friend, not me, but if my friend has a funky disease from Thailand, like, you cover it. Life goes on. Fantastic. OK, next question. There's a question from the, from the app, and then, then we go back to the audience. So uh, how does the Estonian government make money from the e-residents if they don't pay taxes? Mm. They still pay taxes uh, because, for example, if they hire a local employee, they pay taxes. Uh, if they do transactions that include VAT tax, they pay taxes. So there are like many ways how to get the, like income from the, from the, from the residents. So, uh, so it, it doesn't have to be uh, like, like this um, tax heaven. It's not a tax heaven. So uh, if you want tax heaven, like go to Caribbeans. Like, so uh, this is not tax heaven. This is about access and efficiency. Run your company with 10,000, run your company 1,000. How many taxes you just saved? 9,000. But you still pay the same tax to the country. You anyway should pay the tax in, in, in Germany, but now you have 9,000 more. You see the benefit? Become an e-resident. <laughs> Come to me, my people. <laughs> So I have a question, follow up to Patti's question, because uh, this is actually a problem we had in Iceland that elderly and disabled people were excluded from the electronic uh, implementation. In order for them to be able to sign up, they need electronic ID. They have to apply to that themselves, and they cannot do that except with assistance which created the barrier. So were you able to, in Estonia, to actually solve that problem and let them do it with assistance or with paper or just the regular way? Uh, like, even though I would like to say yes, I have to say no. Uh, we were extremely hard with them. So, for example, the fact that now the ID is mandatory, it was law with a certain date. So you have to obey the law. So, uh, I mean, obviously, they don't, didn't get punished or anything like, but, uh, like, I mean, like, Estonia was so pure, poor, 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 uh, that we couldn't afford these kind of debates. I mean, we either do it for the majority and keep the economy super growing super fast, rapidly, or we just have these debates that, like, what if or how we can, and. I mean, that's the main excuse in Denmark and Sweden I have always seen, like, so, uh, so uh, it was a hard choice. So, and hard choice was, uh, like, innovation comes through pain. That's one of our, like, goals. Always innovation comes through pain. Somebody, I mean, e-school, teachers hated it. I mean, like, small numbers, like, uh, we introduced e-school in 2002. Uh, there wasn't any smartphones back then. Uh, computers had, uh, like, Screens like this, you remember that time, right? So, and now 
I used to have convenient diary thing, I just write numbers, and now you say that everything needs to be inside that machine that I cannot use because I'm 65 years old. Yes? I don't do that. Okay, you don't get paid. Okay, I do it. But it was like heavily criticized in media, etc. So it's like half a year period that basically the project manager and the minister needs to survive or die. Has happened. Next question. Yeah, hey, Tare. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. So, and would, uh, my question is quite simple. So, in Ukraine, we are using a kind of application where you're keeping all your documents, all your passports, the driver's license, birth certificates, everything in one application called DIA. Mm -hmm. And what about the Estonian ID? So, does it somehow coincide with it or whatever? Could you specify on it? I have heard that they want to import, uh, import that software to Estonia. Um, I hate the idea. Um, I mean, it's not, I mean, digital societies is not about documents anymore. It's only about information. So the fact, I mean, like, like more and more countries now uh, get rid of driving license. Okay, they don't get rid of them, but you don't have to carry them with you because the police has the information in the system. So I need driving license only when I'm outside of the country because I need to rent a car or something, then I need that. But in Estonia, I never carry a driving license already more than 10 years. So why I need a passport? Like inside European Union, traveling without with passport, we don't need that. National ID card is enough. But I still have to show it, I don't know, in the border of UK. But like inside, we don't need that. We have Schengen and everything. Like. So, uh, so it's not about documents or keeping them inside of app or something. I actually hate everything. I mean, like having a medical record in your phone or on your card, that was a German idea. And when the card is lost, the phone is lost. OK, yeah, it's hard to hack the phone open. But like, why? I mean, like, why can't it be this way that whenever you need information, then you pull it. Until that, it stays one location, one location only because if it's in multiple location, you need multiple security. Multiple security means higher cost. It's fucking so simple. <laughs> right? So you should do it this way. Final question. Uh, do you think that it would be possible that we would see this kind of approach planet-wide? And if yes, when? Uh, which approach? This the, one? The e-government, the, e the, the sort of the whole... Oh, no, 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 no. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> never happens in Europe. <laughs> uh, I mean, come on. If, even if... I mean, it's hard to understand, but, like, like, I think... Like, you laugh together with me, you also engineers, like... Not having a customer ID and still being able to run a country. That's a fucking miracle. Imagine any business doing business without customer ID. I sell you stuff, but the logistics doesn't know if the stock actually goes to that guy or not. It's a miracle. And they don't want to change that. So during your lifetime, no, that doesn't change. But I believe in this. I think this will change. And you will see that. I mean, you are the proof of that. Like you are the part of Drupal community. You are also contributors. You already have, have seen the benefit. You have seen the future. The sad part is that Drupal doesn't make money for you, like, as a community. As a business, yes, but as a community, that's a different story. We will talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Darby. Well, thank you. Uh, please turn around and look at the...